Are you looking to put your products in front of millions of customers? Then Walmart Marketplace is for you. With more than 120 million unique monthly visitors, according to Comscore, Walmart Marketplace is one of the fastest growing e-commerce platforms. Join today and gain instant access to millions of customers from one of the world's largest retailers. Go to marketplace.walmart.com. That's marketplace.walmart.com. Welcome to E-Commerce Conversations, a weekly podcast from Practical E-Commerce, hosted by entrepreneur Eric Bandholz. What is going on, Internet? Eric Bandholz back again with another E-Commerce Conversations. Hope all is well on the other side of the Internet. On the other side of the Internet from me, David, welcome. Thank you. Hey, or, or I, as I should say, hey. <laughs> hey, that is a good term. I can't still can't believe we got that domain name. Hey.com. Yeah. That's crazy, man. All right. So you're a man of many accolades, but I'll hand it over to you. Give me uh, your 30 second pitch on who the hell you are. Sure. My name is David Heinemeyer Hansen. I am a co owner of 37 Signals. We make software products. Our original tool was Basecamp, a project management tool that we've been running now for over 20 years, Basecamp.com. And hey, as you just mentioned, hey.com is our email service we launched a few years ago, an alternative to Gmail. So those are the two products I have. And then I also write a lot. Together with my business partner, Jason Freed, we've written four books on how to start a business, how to run a business, how to... Think about business all the way back to 2006, getting real. Then we published Rework in 2010 that went on to sell about a million copies worldwide. We've done Remote Office Not Required. And finally, it doesn't have to be crazy at work. So that's a little bit about me and the past 20 years of, uh, of my life. It has been Basically, that journey, building up 37 Signals, building these products, and sharing everything that we've learned along the way in books and elsewhere. Yeah, you you guys have a, a natural, candid transparency to you. Like, I, I appreciate your openness and sharing the good and the bad. Uh, before we get into it, I want to tell anyone who's on Shopify right now that you should probably message David and say thank you because Shopify is built on the framework you effectively created, right? R Ruby on Rails. That's right. That's right. Actually, I should have mentioned that too. Um, <laughs> as part of creating Basecamp back in 2003, I created Ruby on Rails, the web framework that is behind Shopify and behind GitHub and Airbnb. It was even the original platform for Twitter and about a million other famous websites and web applications around the world. I also still am working on that. We're actually just putting the final touches on Rails 8, big upgrade coming out here um, for a framework that's been around also for 20 years. And as you say, is powering 10% of worldwide e-commerce, I believe it is. That is what Shopify is responsible for. And I guess that's just Shopify. So if you add on whatever else in the e-commerce world runs on Rails, it's probably an even higher number. But Shopify is the largest Rails application out there. It's a 5 million lines of code and a huge portion of, of all e-commerce in the world. So that's absolutely bonkers. In addition to this, you're a hobbyist race car driver? Yes, I do like my race cars. I've been driving race cars for a good 15 years now. I drive mainly endurance um, events. The 24 hours of Le Mans is my pivotal moment. I've been competing in that event for about 11 years now. Um, so that was one of those spoils I picked up after things went well with the business. I had the opportunity to sit in a race car, felt totally in love with that, and spent then a good chunk of all the money I made since on burning rubber and going around in circles. So let's talk about that. Like you've you've found success. Uh, a lot of our listeners have successful e-commerce businesses. You know, you have. Do you have a wife and kids? Family mm -hmm. as well. Okay. So I do. So three uh, three kids. I want to I want to learn from you, like how you prioritize your day, how you're able to accomplish all these things. Like walk me through, I guess, what it looks like today and then how you got it to today. So I'll start with the last bit, because I think that perhaps is almost the most interesting. We never had a phase 
building our business or designing our organization where we worked a totally different way. Right from the outset, Jason and I, when we started running this business together, were really on the same page about setting the good habits early because we had seen so many times entrepreneurs and businesses try to do the mode switch and failing. They'll work 80 hours, 100 hours a week in the early days and get accustomed, if not outright addicted to that style of working. And then even after it wasn't technically necessary to fight every day for the survival of the business, they stayed in that mode, which meant that work ended up occupying essentially 100% of life. Both Jason and I knew very early on that was not an arrangement we were interested in. One of the reasons we wanted to build our own business was such that we could do it for the long term, that it wasn't about a let's trade the next five, seven, 10 years of our life for a moonshot. And then if it succeeds, wonderful, we'll retire to Mojito Island and just enjoy the spoils and the sunset uh, ever since. Because I don't actually think that works. I've not seen a lot of examples of successful entrepreneurs who were able to put their all in to a business and then at some point go like, oh, boom, I'm done. I can just sit down and and retire. Usually what happens is they put it all in and then they end up being 30, 40, 50 years old and then the big exit arrives and they sell their business and now they have all this money and then they go to Mojito Island and they sit there for about three weeks and then they get bored out of their bloody minds and then they go like, yeah, no, let me get back into the action. And then they get right back into the action and they have essentially then spent some of those decades of life where they could do other things. You mentioned race car driving. You can become a race car driver at your, when you're 50 years old. There are folks who do that. They're not very good. They just aren't. That's just not how biology works. You do not get sharper. Your reflexes aren't more adept after you pass 40. It only goes one way and that's downhill. So if you want to taste some of the other delicious parts of life, you should think about when they're accessible, when they're ripe. Race car driving is ripe from, I mean, whatever, your 20s, your 30s, and then from there it's downhill. So if I had told myself, oh, no, do you know what? I just need to be 100% business all the time to maximize whatever it is that we're doing right now. And then after I've done all that a uh, decade or two away from now, then I will, quote, unquote, enjoy myself. Uh, I don't think that was going to work. So that was never how we designed the business. We designed the business from the get-go that we were going to work 40 hours a week. That 40 hours a week, eight hours a day is plenty. It's enough. In fact, my perspective and that of Jason too is that it's more than enough. In fact, negative things often happen when you push beyond that, when you are so myopically focused on work being the total sum of life, that you miss other things. You don't have the right perspective on stuff. And you also end up thinking that it's all about input, which it's not. It's all about output. And the leverage, the torque between those two things is, is highly variable, dependent on your ideas and your approach and your perspective. So maybe you should think a little bit more or think a little closer about optimizing those things, optimizing the torque factor, optimizing the leverage that you can get out of the hours you put in, and then you can enjoy life alongside it. So if you look at how my life is today, it's quite similar to how it was back then. It starts a little earlier. I now have three kids. I did not have three kids when we started working together. So this schedule could be a bit more flexible in those early days. It could go a little longer. It could start a little later. Now my schedule is a bit more regimented, but I actually see that as a benefit. I see it as a benefit that the eight-hour block that I have dedicated to work is rather fixed. At six o'clock, it's going to be dinner time and I'm needed with the kids and then I can enjoy the night with them. In the morning, I have to drop them off at school so I can't just jump straight into thing. I got this block and do you know what? I better well make it count. And that's one of the things I've found and seen over and over again from entrepreneurs who perhaps take special pride in bragging about how much they work is that their definition of work is a little loose. It usually means sitting in front of a computer for maybe many hours, but what's the output of those hours? Are you actually making them count? The way I make them count is through long stretches of uninterrupted time. 
there's this idea of the the maker schedule or the manager schedule. I try to be on a maker schedule most days of most weeks. That's not a luxury I can do every day or every week, but it is surprisingly amenable to design that you can structure your business in such a way that you don't have a day that's full of meetings. When I look at my schedule, very often it's empty. Like there'll be day and another day and another day. There's nothing on that damn calendar, which I mean, it's actually a misnomer. The calendar is full. That day is full. It's full of one long, beautiful block of uninterrupted time that I can dedicate to solving the problems I care deeply about and then require me to think for more than 20 minutes here or 40 minutes there or whatever else, whatever crumbs are usually left over from a lot of entrepreneurs' schedule once they've sliced it up with all these meetings and all these obligations and all these things that they need to check in on, we've designed 37 Signals to not need that level of constant minding and direct intervention that's trying to be synchronized. We do most of our status updates, for example. We don't have daily stand-ups. We don't have status update meetings where we sit around in a circle and tell each other what we've done one at a time. We use Basecamp. We use Basecamp's automated questions. It'll ask every employee on Monday morning, what are you going to work on this week? They will record it for the whole company to know, not just to their manager, not just to me, not just to Jason, but to everyone. So everyone is on the loop on what's going on in the business. And then at the end of every day, the system asks, what have you worked on today? And that clock frequency allows me as the quote unquote manager, as the part-time manager, to check in on the business, to develop a trust that the people we've hired are doing the work that we intend for them to do, and that they're going in the right direction without me sitting on their shoulders, constantly supervising them and figuring out, oh, are you actually doing this? Should I constantly realign? And then we run on this other thing called the, the Shape Up Cycle Schedule. We run in six-week cycles. We have six of those a year. And each of those six cycles, that's when we do our planning. We plan only for the very near term, the things we're going to do essentially immediately. And we plan in a sort of loose way where we go like, hey, here are the, whatever, five things we'd love for our products to improve in that direction, or we have to tackle this. Here's a sketch of the rough outline of that. And it's only a sketch and it's a sketch with a fat marker, not a thin pen, because it's not done in detail. It's done in coarse strokes. And then the team figures out, okay, well, we got six weeks or in other cases, maybe three weeks of time budget to do this work. Here's a sketch of roughly what it should look like. Let's get to work figuring out what that means. And that process is just like my schedule where I like long stretches of uninterrupted time. They are afforded the same. They're afforded the same because I'm not constantly interrupting them. I'm letting them do their job. And it is incredible how much time you have in a 40-hour week when no one is constantly bothering you. 40 hours is an absolute luxurious amount of time to make tremendous progress. But most people don't see it that way because they squander it. They cut it into little bits and then they end up Friday evening or Friday afternoon going, oh man, I was so busy this week, so busy. What did I get done? Oh, I guess we had the meeting about that thing and then we had to check it. Nothing. Like yeah. it's like sand just getting out through your fingers. Don't want to work like that. Don't have to work like that. And because we don't, there's room for the other things. There's room for kids. There's room for racing. There's room for hobbies and vacations and time off and all these things while still making progress on Basecamp. And hey, we're working on two products, new products now simultaneously. I'm working on Rails 8. I, I write a bunch. There's room for all this stuff that looks impossible to a lot of people when they view it from the outside because what they have in their head is that how do you do all this stuff when you also have to do all the stuff that I think everyone has to do? And my answer is always, but I'm not doing that stuff. Yeah. It's not like I'm just putting all this stuff on top of a manager's schedule filled with three meetings a day. No, no, no. That would never work. That I, No human is able of doing it. Well, maybe Elon Musk. I don't know. If you oh, yeah. literally put in 120 hours or you sleep on the factory floor or whatever, you can probably do some crazy things. God bless him in that direction. I don't have that ability. I just have the ability to clear the decks 
and then get stuff done. I, I want to go back to your your kind of your daily prompts. So you said you have a weekly prompt on Monday. Say, so what are you going to do this week? And then you have a daily evening. What did you do today? How much insight and information are you looking to get from your team on those updates? Are you expecting, you know, just like simple words or kind of like a paragraph of, of information on what they worked on? I'm expecting essentially a story. Okay. And if that story can focus on whatever you want to emphasize, this is one of the reasons why we collect this information in an open text field. It's not derived from what to-dos you've checked off. It's not derived from which files you uploaded. It's not automated. It is a opportunity to you to reflect on what did I do today that was important that I would like to convey to others. Sometimes the answer is pretty mundane. Oh, I still worked on this same project. Here's a quick anecdote about a an issue I encountered and why it was hard and why it sucked up a lot of my time. And then sometimes, oftentimes, those anecdotes become conversation starters in the comment thread for that update. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'll chime in, oh, interesting. I hadn't seen, or I had seen that problem somewhere else too. Here's how I solved it over there. Maybe you can do that too. Or someone else from another part of the business goes like, oh, actually we had a customer just ask about that. Like it's an opportunity to have those hallway conversations that people like to muse about when you work in an office, when working remotely across a much greater part of a much broader span of the business. Because all of these updates that we have Basecamp ask people, they're public to everyone. Yeah. Like if you work in an office and you occasionally have that hallway conversation or water cooler conversation, it's usually contained to your team, right? Like you sit together with a small number of people, and you bump into them at these locations and, and whatnot. Here, when you do it on Basecamp, everyone gets to see everything. Now, again, I don't know how that works at a 2,000 person company. That's not us. We're 60 some people. It works great at 60 some people. It worked great at 40. It worked great at 20. I'm sure there is a barrier at some point where you start to fence things in for advantage. But but you're, us, you're not that, you're not reading all sixty, right? You're just reading your direct reports, or do you have direct reports? No, I, I scan. I I usually scan most of it, and okay. that is the other beautiful part of writing status updates down rather than sitting in a meeting. There's no way I could ever sit in a status update meeting with sixty people and wait for each single one to tell me over the next 10, 15 minutes what they were working on. I mean, I'd blow my brains out. I just right. don't have the patience for that. What I do have the patience for, and what, for better or worse, I feel like most of humanity has optimized its skill in, is to scroll quickly across a lot of information and then use your brain to spot the patterns you want to pick out. So I usually scroll through the majority of these check-ins on either a daily basis or at least a weekly basis. And then just as scrolling fast through something on Twitter, oh, your eye catches something. What, what was that again? Let me scroll back up. Boom. And that's what's so amazing. I can consume in kind of a bird's eye view way the status updates of 50 people in about five minutes. Yeah. Maybe not five. If I really dig in, maybe it's 10 because I chime in on a few of them. But that's an incredible leverage. Again, that is the kind of technique that enables your day to look very different. If you had a day, even just with your direct reports, where you're trying to do weekly one-on-ones, I mean, that's a common management technique that you set aside an, an hour every week for each of your reports, and boom, before you know it, 10 hours of your week are spoken for. And it's actually not 10, it's more like 20, because the crumbs that are available in between the appointments are worth so little that they barely count. So we end up with a dynamic where we spend so much less time on that radiation of information, as someone at our company coined the uh, term, that everyone is radiating information. There's just this heat coming off and you're basically just basking in the glow of that and you pick out the things that matter, but you do it in so much more efficient way because we can read, we can scan so much quicker than I can listen to someone articulate every single word of their status update. That's not an efficient way to do these updates. And I think they're also very constraining exactly for that reason, because it kind of takes so long to convey status in the meetings first way. You usually constrain it to like five people, seven people, whatever the team size is. And now you have a information cocoon where 
each group is separated by other groups. And now you need a layer of middle management to coordinate the information between the groups because not everyone can follow up on everything. And then before you know it, you have a full-on bureaucracy staffed with full-time managers who are just making things exponentially more complicated, more like a game of telephone where information is constantly lost. Um, we tried a small version of that for a couple of years where we had a few full-time managers and it really didn't work out. And now we're back to our original configuration, which is zero full-time managers. Out of the 60 people we have, every single one of them, including Jason, including me, treat management as a second job, essentially. A second job that we like to minimize. We like to only put on that hat when it's necessary. In a lot of weeks, it's not. If you set up processes like we talked about with status updates and so forth, well, there's a whole category of traditional management that no longer needs to be done. And when you treat management of this moonlighting gig, essentially, um, you are so heavily motivated to look for those kinds of optimizations just that you can get back to the thing that really powers you, right? So why am I running a business? Well, I run a business and I work on product because I really love making things with other people. That's what I like doing. So I like working with other programmers and designers and we're making new products, we're making frameworks, we're making all these things. That's the part that fires me up. And the more we can just get to that part, the more the, the happier we all are. Yeah. So that is essentially a, a process or an aspiration for minimalist management. Not zero management, right, you're right. delusional you if you think you can get away with zero. You can never get away with zero. There'll always be performance problems, there'll be friction, there'll be issues you have to deal with. You have to deal with those things. So don't think it's about 100%, it's about 90%. It's about how can we reduce or eliminate 80, 90% of all these management routines that we think are so urgent? Well, a great way to do it is to not dedicate a fixed 40 hours a week to it. That's what a full-time manager has. They have to yeah. fill. 40 hours a week, and they will, everyone will. That's Parkinson's law. The work will expand to fill the time available to it. And I think it's very dangerous. And I think it has a tendency to distort a lot of organization, especially around our size. There is a tipping point right around 50, 60, 70 people where most organizations go, oh, whatever we were doing before isn't working. Here comes the middle management. Yeah. Here comes the installation of that layer. And then you end up in a very awkward place, which was what we were in for a little while, for a little bit, where once you install that layer of middle management, the organization really doesn't want to be 80. It wants to be 150. And then whether the problems you're solving or the business you have can carry 150, it's a little bit irrelevant towards the push to drive from that layer. That's just the incentives that are built up in that. Um, and then you can end up with some real distortions. And we ended up deciding, do you know what? No, we don't want that. Can we, we, 60 is a magical number in that regard where you can run an entire organization with zero full time managers. And maybe we so should. So, is stay the goal, here. yeah, are you, are you not going to grow beyond it? Is this like you've, you've hit business bliss? We'll call it that, where, you know, like more, what do they say? More money, more problems or whatever. Like, you know, bigger growth, bigger problems. Like, so what's interesting, I think, is that the software business, specifically the SaaS software business, is quite unique in how disconnected it is from inputs and outputs. If I make a wonderful piece of software that's easy to use, it actually doesn't cost me that much more to have 10,000 customers versus 5,000 customers. Like The economies of scale are pretty dramatic. The marginal cost of the additional customer is very, very low. So what I generally is most inspired by and most fired up about is how we can make more happen, more product, more uh, enable more customers with the same team size. And what I find found is that that is usually very possible. There are some limits. Customer service, for example, is one limit that's kind of related to that. Usually there's some degree of linearity between a given version of a software and how many support tickets or support emails that that creates. But even that isn't fixed. And very often what you'll find is, let's say, you have a customer base that's producing 500 emails a day. And 
You then change the product. You make onboarding easier. Suddenly that's 400 emails a day, not 500. You've just saved essentially two people on customer support in that equation from making the product easier to understand. And this was a lesson we learned very early on. For the first three years of the business, and by the third year, we were making millions of dollars. Jason, my business partner, was the only supporter in the company. He answered every single support email, and at the end of it, he was entering 150 emails a day on a customer base that was literally in the tens of thousands. And you think, like, how is that possible? Well, it's possible because Jason had just, he was mainlining straight into his veins every single bit of friction, every confusing part of the interface, every convoluted setup, every technical deficiency. He was mainlining that into his veins and it came out immediately as priorities for what to fix. So if if that hadn't been the case, right? Let's say Jason hadn't been in that location. By the time he was answering 150 emails a day, we probably should have been answering a thousand because he was able to just continuously reduce the support burden by, by doing this. Now, that gets harder when you no longer have the literal CEO of the company answering every right. single customer. But there are ways to stay more in contact with that and dealing with that as a specific business problem, not treating it as a law of nature that, okay, if you have 10,000 additional customers, they'll produce another 150 emails a day. Therefore, we must hire three more support people for each 10,000 customers. It doesn't have to be that way. Um, software is very malleable in that regard. Now, that's not true of every business. It's not true of every function. There are some functions that don't work like that, but software is pretty amazing in its degree it can work like that. And it's not just on the support side, it's also on the production side. So Basecamp and Hey are web applications that also have native apps. But if we look at just the main web applications, we have about six programmers who do the work to move those forward on our cycle basis. That is a very, very small team for a very large number of customers and users. And the reason why it can be so small is that we apply those same principles to the technical domain in which we work. That's why we build Ruby on Rails. That's why we build our own tools. When you're really serious about that level of efficiency, you end up usually building your own tools that are specialized or optimized for that domain you're in. And that's the instinct we have because we can't just spend other people's money. 37 Signals has been bootstrapped since day one. We sold a minority slice of the business back in 2006 to Jeff Bezos, actually. But that was all secondaries. None of the money went into the business. The business has been profitable since day one, which means to this day, whenever we save $1, Jason and I get to split it. Yeah. I mean- we have a profit share uh, program as well, so the employees are incentivized to be part of it, and Jeff Bezos still owns a part of it. So, I mean, we split it with yeah, yeah. with a few interested parties, but there's a direct translation between how efficient we're able to run, how profitable we're able to run, and the outcomes that we see that are not present in a lot of other technology businesses because they're not founded on a model where the founders make any financial gains really from just being profitable. They make their financial gains by selling the business, by an exit because they're VC funded and so forth. So I think this is one of the reasons we end up with this very uh, sometimes controversial view on things because we're playing with our own chips and you yeah. just play the game differently when it's your own stack versus you being an agent on behalf of someone else's stack. Yeah, I'm I'm same way. We're 12, 12 years bootstrapped, unfortunately. We've had a tough couple of years these past years. I want to talk about you guys had pretty public tough years, I think, in terms of like culture and not everyone seeing the world and maybe bringing some politics inside. Walk me through what happened there and that process for resolving it and getting the team to focus on the important things, which is serving your customers. Yes. So in 2021, spring of 2021, we had a big blow up at the company that it wasn't just about the spring of 2021. It had been brewing for several years in advance. And the brew essentially was the kind of affliction that hit a lot of companies in the U.S., particularly in the tech sector, that politics became an ever-growing part of the internal discourse at the company. The uh, sort of set of 
or a small set, I would say, of employees who felt that that was actually their primary mission and then the business was the secondary mission. And they were interested in advocating for their primary mission. They wanted the company to do more. They wanted the company to make statements. They wanted the company to do this, that, and the other thing. And it was happening at a time where America was going through some shit. Let's just put it like that, right? Like the, the culture of... Uh, DEI and Black Lives Matters and riots and all the things, right? And then throwing pandemic on top of it, it was really a pressure cooker. And what Jason and I came to realize was that that pressure cooker was taking our company in a direction where we didn't want to go, towards a place we didn't want to work. And we looked at that and we said to each other, why are we doing this? Why are we letting this... Um, degree of politics infect the culture and the vibe of the company to such a degree that we, the owners, don't even really enjoy it anymore. That's That's got to change. Even if it's difficult, even if it's hard, even if it's clearly fraught with all sorts of risks to make a change like that. But we said, you know what? In the end, we don't have to work here anymore. So I don't want to work at a place that I don't enjoy. I want to return this company to the kind of atmosphere that we started, that we ran for many, many years, and that somewhere along the way, in just a few short years, got taken off track by an ideology that was ripping through the industry. And we said, you know what? We got to just say no. So that's what we did. In the spring of 2021, we said, we're not going to talk about politics at work, during work hours, on work platforms anymore. We're not going to drag in a discussion about BLM or this, that, or the other thing into the same tools and systems we're using to discuss new features and new whatever. First of all, it's creating a, I mean, I hate this fucking word. I'm just going to use it actually in spite. It's creating a toxic work <laughs> environment because there are plenty of folks here who don't share those whatever ideologies that's being advanced and they don't feel comfortable speaking up because they know what the consequences can be when you're sort of speaking against the dominant strain. And second of all, we make project management software. We make an email system. These are not topics that we're put in the world to solve. These are not topics that the vast majority of our customers actually give a hoot about what we think about. They may personally be interested in it. They don't need their project management software to also weigh in on which way the culture of America should go, let alone the fact that half of our business is outside of America. Half of our staff is outside of America. So it's very myopic that we're centering this political discourse of the U.S. as as important as it ended up being. But that was still a time where that was not an easy thing to do. And it was not a free thing to do either. So when we did it, it, it really blew up, both in terms of a public spectacle, if you will. I mean, we trended on Twitter for like 48 hours. And I think I got something like 30,000 tweets hurling all sorts oh, yeah. of insults and whatever against us. Not because we took any position on any of the political hot topics well, of well, the no day. no position is a position is, exactly. is kind of like the right? downside of it. Si silence is violence. That was one yeah. of the uh, so, uh, <laughs> memes I, I, of the time. In hindsight, how do you think that crept into your culture? Like, do you think it was a couple of key mishires or was it just not stamping it out when it was really small? Like if you had to go back in time to, let's say 2016 or 18 or whatever, like, and you could see it before it built up, what would you do differently? I was definitely not aware of just how powerful a social sort or um, source of uh, whatever this was at the time that what was building. It was sort of like uh, the tsunami where the water just retracts out to the sea for quite a long time. And unless you actually know that, unless you know this is how a tsunami forms, you just go like, oh, what a curious phenomenon. I wonder why all the water is going out to, out to sea right up until the wave is smashing you and demolishing you. So if anything, I think I wish I would have been more informed on just the... Uh, the genealogy of the ideology. I, I came to be more informed after we had our big blow up because I was trying to understand how could something like this happen? This is such a curious phenomenon. Um, and it took quite 
a long time of study to figure that out. So would have I have known that in advance? I probably wouldn't. What I do wish was that we had seen some of those early signs. And I'll give you just one example. When we published our latest book, it doesn't have to be crazy at work. We <laughs> previewed it internally first. And we got a very curious yet surprisingly hot debate about the title. Yeah. And the problem for a number of employees was that we used the word crazy, that the word crazy was part of it doesn't have to be crazy at work. And that was seen as ableist, as potentially offensive to people with mental issues. And like you can imagine the rest of it. And when it first was raised, Jason and I was like, oh, OK, I don't know. Maybe we have a blind a spot here. Let's all right. Let's listen to the feedback. Let's sit down. Let's talk about it. Let's try to think through it and let's take it seriously. And we did. And we spent a couple of days and we weren't like, well, first of all, the reason the book is called It Doesn't Have to Be Crazy at Work is because that's what people say. Yeah. You ask someone, oh, how's work? Oh, man, work's been crazy. We've been doing this. Right. You know it. it everyone knows it. That's a common phrase that people are doing. It's not that's not a reflection of how you feel about mental illness. Crazy is just part of the vernacular. The other thing we did, which we thought was sort of ironic, but actually ended up just making the whole discussion even more inflammatory, was we searched our internal systems for the word crazy. And what we found was that a bunch of people who were very offended that we would use that word as part of a book title, used the word all the time. Oh, the craft Funny. traffic was crazy. Uh, the venue was crazy. Work was crazy. That was a crazy is one of those words that ended up on the naughty list in a very curious way. And then somehow managed to remain on the naughty list of good political standing while also existing in natural standard use all the time. And I thought that was one of the those early instances where I went like, wow. I can't imagine us having this discussion five years ago. I can't imagine that these sentiments would have been cultivated and activated in this way five years ago. But, oh, okay. I don't know. Maybe this is just a one-off. I mean, it wasn't, right? Yeah. It was not a one-off. And this was 18, I think, well before the crescendo of nonsense that followed afterwards. So you can just imagine how things would get nuttier and nuttier from there, and they sure did. So I don't know how actually I would have done things differently. And yeah. even more to the point, though, I kind of also didn't want it to be different. And the reason I say that is even though it was really difficult for about two weeks, probably two of the hardest weeks I've had in 25 years of being involved with this business, because not only were we sort of the Internet's main character in, in a little circle for a little while, and that's always kind of hard, but... We've had versions of that in the past, although not quite as intensive as that and not quite as vicious as that. But the fact that inside the company, that was the worst time we've ever had as a company. Oh. Like, as you can imagine, when all this is going on and we ended up having a, a third of the company take an offer that Jason and I extended to people, which was that you could get three to six months pay by simply leaving if you were not willing to work at a company that wasn't going to discuss politics at work during work hours. Like we said like, all right, fine. If that's what you want, go find it somewhere else. It's not going to be here. Here's a really easy way. Here's a really easy way for you to choose. We're going to give you three to six months salary. And this was at the height of the hiring bonanza and tech, right? The majority of these people could simply just cash that check and then go get another job next week, which quite a few of them did. And great. I would have paid 10 times the amount of money we paid to settle that ideological cancerous debate at our company. Right, that toxicity out. Hey, getting that out, right? Like, okay, really painful, but we got it out. And now, as many people have found, when they go through something that's very difficult, but they make it through to the other side, they're actually thankful for what they went through. They're thankful for the opportunity to be tested in ways that could have broken you, but didn't. And you end up invariably stronger on the other side by having gone through that. And I think I ended up invariably wiser. I spent an enormous time studying the phenomenon and the roots of it just to learn what the hell happened. And I don't think I would have done that otherwise. I also ended up changing my perspective on quite a few things and my personal engagement with everything from social media to ideas 
to political factions and so forth, just because it was such a uh, catalyst for changing your mind. And I think of in the physical realm, I've seen testimonials from people who've gotten cancer and beaten cancer, where they're like, I'm really happy I got cancer, which sounds like just an oxymoron. Why would you ever be happy about getting cancer? Well, in those cases, they were happy because it was a way for them to reflect on their life and really change how they did things, who they were and where they were going. A real reassessment of their values and their principles and, and how all of that manifested into a life well lived. I look upon that instant as both for the company at large, this was one of the, the hardest and yet most healing moments of company history. For me personally, it was one of the hardest and ultimately most rewarding experiences to have gone through. David, you're a wealth of information. Where can people pick your brain, find you, follow you, buy your products? DHH.DK is my personal website. It links to the products that I work on at 37 Signals. It links to my books and it links to my Hey World newsletter, which I write on quite a lot, sometimes too much for people. They're like, oh, so you're doing all this stuff. How do you how do you send me an email newsletter five times a week? But I put out a lot of stuff on there. And then, of course, I'm also on Twitter, X, at DHH. You can follow me either of those places, and you will get more than you ever wished for of these <laughs> kind of similar thoughts. I love it. I love it. Thanks for coming on the show, sharing your stories. Uh, as always, guys, this has been another e-commerce conversations. Hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Cheers, and keep on growing. Oh.